Orphaned at the age of eight, married at 14, and widowed at 20 with a daughter to raise, few would bet on a person facing those obstacles to become a path-breaking millionaire. Now, consider that this woman was born in the Deep South in 1867, the first in her family to be born free of the bonds of slavery. How do you like those odds? Today, we'll hear from Professor Nancy Kane about her case, Madam C.J. Walker, entrepreneur, leader, and philanthropist. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you're listening to Cold Call. So we are all sitting there in the classroom. The professor walks in. And, and they look up, and you know it's coming. Oh, the dreaded cold call. Professor Kane is a business historian whose research and writing focuses on entrepreneurial leadership. Nancy, welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. This is a, a fabulous case. We've timed this uh, to, to coincide with Black History Month, uh, February. Um, and as I read it, I, I, I was just uh, astonished at, at what Madam C.J. Walker was able to accomplish, given the context of her time. So I wonder if you could start just by telling us, how does this case open up? What's the opening scene on the case? I think the opening scene is is really when she begins in what today we would call middle age, uh, 1906, so she's 39, begins her own hair care company. She became a well-known entrepreneur and a social activist, turn of the 20th century, so beginning of the 20th century, um, leader from that platform, from building her own business. And... It takes her a long, slow burn to get there. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a burn, as you said in your introduction, that's characterized not only by her social and economic circumstances. She's the first freed child uh, of her family. Her parents were slaves uh, in the Deep South. And she's initially illiterate. um, And she is... You know, she's a single mother at the by the age of 21, and she moves to the north as part of the early stages of the Great Northern Migration, as it would be known, and sets up shop as a washerwoman. So mm-hmm. that long, slow burn, what I like to call in my history of leadership class, her gathering years. Every mm-hmm. leader has gathering years. Yeah. When they're absorbing, learning, putting pieces together. Steve Jobs would later call that period his wilderness years and talk about connecting the dots of that experience. Mm-hmm. Madam Walker's gathering years are an African-American woman with a deep sense of purpose, bending over literally a washerboard, scrubbing white people's laundry. Yeah. And yeah. and the turning point is really 1906 when she decides, after a brief stint as a saleswoman for another black entrepreneur's hair care products, that she can do this Mm -hmm. herself. Mm -hmm. And from there on out, it is really the story of a hawk that begins to realize its wingspan, Mm -hmm. stretching its wings, taking off from the cliff, and riding the currents. I love that metaphor. Let's go back to, uh, you know, Sarah Breedlove. Uh, I want to understand a little bit more about her context, the situation into which she's born, the political climate at the time. This is two years post-Civil War. What was it like to be Uh, a black person in America at that time? Well, it was a moment of astounding change, a great inflection point. The war had ended, slavery was over, Lincoln had been assassinated, but some of the groundwork for what were then, um, for him, nebulous reconstruction plans was in place, including Mm -hmm. the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, then the 14th Amendment that gives all African American citizenship, and then the 15th Amendment giving black male Americans the right to vote. So it's a moment of great possibility. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are lots and lots of obstacles for for black Americans that white Americans of, of any ilk did not face. But it's still a, a moment of chance and new beginnings. And that lasts for about 12 years. And then through a set of elite political changes and great resentment and racism and fear in the South, a lot of doors start closing, mm-hmm. and a period begins that today historians, black and white, know as the Nader, a period that lasts approximately 40 years from 1877 well into the 20th century of the closing of all those doors right. and of what today we think of as institutionalized, if informally so, institutionalized racism. This is the beginnings of the quick disenfranchisement through all kinds of underhanded ways, such as limiting ballot access, closing polls, requiring identification, some of the things we're still talking about in our own time. And so a varied set of doors at the high levels and on the street or on the ground, a lot of opportunities which are quickly held before black Americans disappear or are taken away. And this is ironically 
or perhaps most interestingly, the moment when Madam Walker is beginning, her, really beginning to think about her life. Right. Meanwhile, Sarah Breedlove, she will later marry and be known as Madam Walker, taking her husband's name. Meanwhile, Sarah Breedlove has joined a church. And the church, the black church, which many historians and others have have held up and understood and analyzed as this incredibly powerful social force, inspirational gas tank, mm-hmm. um, cohesive body, elevating institution, you know, becomes an important part of her life. It's where she meets people. It's where she gets a sense of other black women taking opportunity. It's where she gets access to her own power. So let's pause there for a second. It's in these circles that she starts to take notice of the appearance of the people around her. Uh, and she starts to recognize that, you know, uh, people who are going to be successful need to have a certain demeanor and a certain appearance about them. You note in the case, you know, women, because of their health conditions, because of the situation they were in, their hair just becomes brittle and breaks. And, and this triggers an idea for her. She looks around, not unlike Estee Lauder, a, a generation later looking around at New York and all the women pouring into st- stenography pools and into department stores as clerks and thinking women that are going to work want take extra special care in their appearance often or take a different kind of care in their appearance and are willing to spend for it. She looks around and says, I, I think I can help these women. Uh, Madam Walker or Sarah Breedlove at the time looks around and says, um, I can do this better with some ideas from other products, including uh, a woman named Annie Turnbow, who was uh, a pioneer in this field as well. A a few years before Sarah Breedlove, later Madam Walker, she concocts, that's, she mixes up what she calls her miracle hair grower Uh and starts selling it door to door. Before long, 1906 becomes 1907, and she's beginning to gain traction. Mm -hmm. What I found really fascinating about this, she's gaining traction. She is really bought into this notion that this is it's about appearance, but it's about something much bigger than that. It's about elevating oneself in a significant way. But you mentioned the tension that existed in society at that time, about, particularly among blacks, about, about trying to become white. Right. Talk a little bit about that sort of the tensions around those so, things. Yeah, so very interestingly, um, not all hair care products are universally embraced by the African-American black community at the time. Uh, Booker T. Washington, who many of our listeners will know, and W.E.B. Du Bois, activists, educators, spokespeople for the black race at the time, were two vocal opponents of particularly hair bleach on the ground you know, that black people should not be pursuing any kind of tools or, or means that make them appear more white. There was a wonderful quote in the case from a well-known black spokeswoman who said, if black women would spend half as much time trying to elevate their race as they do trying to look white, things would proceed to pace. Mm -hmm. And so the market for for hair care products is, is in some ways a politically charged one. And Madam Walker enters that market fully conscious of this. She was completely knowledgeable of what was going on in black political circles. Yeah. And that is what's another very interesting thing about this person. The, the importance of leaders pulling information, self-educating, no matter what their field, is, in my experience as a scholar of leadership, universal and extremely significant to their later impact and their careers. And she realizes, I'm not going to do hair bleach, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on straightening. My product is designed to give women beautiful, healthy heads of hair. And P.S., lots and lots of women at the turn of the century, white and black, um, suffered from hair loss. Mm -hmm. And so part of what she's trying to do is give women great hair. And, And so that is her pitch. That is her value proposition. But your point, Brian, about the self empowerment here is perhaps the most significant or most critical of all. What she realized as she began her own career as an entrepreneur was that she was really investing in herself. In discovering her own power, she was discovering kind of the higher road she should travel. Mm -hmm. The product was the means to something better for the self. Mm -hmm. And for Madam Walker, it was, I can help you be a better version of yourself. I can help you rise. Yeah. And you see her as she gets going here, s- selling her consumers, her customers on the idea of rising and being better and obtaining your dreams. And then you see it really powerfully with her growing sales force. Right. Which was really interesting as well, because she set some precedents with her sales force and her model for scaling this business that, that are still in practice today. Absolutely. So uh, just to remind our listeners, the birth of what today we would call sales, a sales force, a national sales force, was really just 
just happening at the time that Madame Walker's getting going. So Singer Sewing Machine, Duke Cigarettes, Sears and Roebuck, IBM, Smith and Wesson, all kinds of businesses were trying to distribute their products. How do we get our products out across a, a nation where communication and transportation is still not completely consistent and completely reliable? We use right. a sales force. So we have to train our sales force. We have to figure out how to hire them. We have to figure out how to motivate with them. We have to figure out how to pay them. She is on the cutting edge of that kind of work. Mm-hmm. I think of all the people I've studied, she is one of the most progressive and imaginative. So just to give you a few high points, she decides she's going to look for her aspiring salespeople, her representatives, in places like black churches, where she herself had had discovered empowerment. Later, she will also go to black training and vocational schools Mm -hmm. and secondary schools. And her value proposition to them, her internal value proposition, or if you will, social contract, is join me. We're going to give you a livelihood of your own. And it becomes very appealing to a lot of women. By the time she dies in 1919, suddenly, abruptly of kidney failure, she has 40,000 people That's working for her yeah. all over the all over the country and in a few cases in Cuba and other parts of what today we would call Central America. Yeah. And she started this, this by the way at the age of 36. That's when she first, you know, started to spread her wings as you right. described it. And how long was it between then and when she died in So she dies in 1919. You know, in her early fifties. So, in her early 50s, but the so. real, the real ramping up. It's a very steep runway. The real ramping up of her business begins, 1907, 1908, 1909. It's really about 11, 12 years yeah. of really taking this thing up steeply and growing it very rapidly. That the kind of impact that she exercises occurs. Mm-hmm. So it's a short time. You wonder how much of that, the steepness of that growth and of that possibility and of that impact is related to all the the, the wilderness years. Mm-hmm. Right? It's almost as if she had a lot of time to figure this out, think about it, but when she got there, she was ready, <laughs> ready to, to go. go. Yeah. You know, and the circumstances, as you point out, were, were right, and that's a critically important part of any entrepreneurial venture succeeding. But, but the, the most important thing in, in the early years of any business is the entrepreneur's relationship, the leader's relationship with him or herself. Mm-hmm. Can I do this? What do I do with doubt? What do I do with the setbacks? What is really clear to me, thinking back again on this woman, is that when she discovered hair care and what she might do with it, she understood herself well enough and knew, had the tools of emotional awareness and management that she could stretch those wings and and get right into the currents. Right, right. Now, let's also focus a little bit on the other word in the title, philanthropist. This was critically important to her to be able to give back. This is corporate social responsibility yeah, in the at the turn of the century in the 1900s. Absolutely. And and it's interesting her philanthropy, um, to use a fancy word for what was, you know, penny scraped together in the early years begins before she's really grown a successful business. So mm-hmm. even as a washerwoman and piecing together income, she is giving money to causes that she deems uh, important from within her church. This sense that I want to contribute to society is part of the gas tank of her motivation and her character. It, every, with every chance she gets, she gives back. Um, she establishes, and again, in a very eerie forerunner of Oprah's Angel Network, she establishes something called the Benevolent Association for her salespeople, uh, designed to aid women that are in need or have medical issues or, uh, again, uh, uh, what today we would call a kind of, it's almost like a 401k, except that the employees don't contribute to it. Right. And then there, as she grows in stature on the public stage, she will make gifts to war relief victims in the First World War. She will make gifts to other black causes. She will make gifts to black universities. So she is, uh, you know, a, a real social activist um, and benefactress, as well as an entrepreneur and um, a motivator and a leader. And you get this strong sense from what she left in the way of writings from her great-great-granddaughter, a woman named Layla Bundles, who has written about her. You get the sense from Layla, who knows the family lore well, that this was just a woman who was a kind of force of nature. Yeah. Right. She was beautiful. She was spirited. She loved to drive her Model T Ford fast, <laughs> right? And often she was a great cook. She loved to entertain. You know, she took her, her place, if you will. And yet through all that, her humanity, her sense of obligation to others, 
her commitment to making a social progressive impact remained completely undaunted. She never lost her her sense of being part of the African American community. She didn't do this by becoming white, not so to all. speak. Not at all. Her social life and most of her life was completely and deeply embedded in the African American community. And yet she was part of a group of people, black and white, that that went to the White House to lobby Woodrow Wilson for certain kinds of war relief toward the end of World War One. I. I mean, she lived comfortably in white society, yeah. and yet her her roots and her identity were African American. When you discuss this in class, what surprise? Are there any surprises? I guess that that emerge out of that conversation. How do students react to it? I'm always, I, I'm always surprised by how quickly students embrace her. Every year, I'm reminded anew of the power of this story with students. Um, in, in several respects. First, most white American students, or most of my white students, have not heard of her, regardless of what country they're from. All of my African American students have heard. Second thing, the women in the class, regardless of nationality or, or um, of ethnic origin, just are astounded by her. Astounded by a woman who had so much zip and drive and goodness and kindness and humanity and fashion sensibility and just, you know, street smarts married to serious leadership savvy. And they're just astounded by her. But I think the most interesting and surprising thing, again, I'm, I'm reminded of this anew every year, is the social impact piece. People think, as you implied, Brian, that corporate social responsibility is a relatively new phenomenon or commitment. It's not. And here she is, you know, 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, blazing a trail in this respect. And I think the students are inspired, impressed, and engaged by that. Well, count me among those who were really inspired by, by this story. Nancy, thank you for joining us. Real pleasure. Thank you. You can find this and many more cases in the HBS Case Collection at hbr.org. I'm Brian Kenny, and you've been listening to Cold Call, the official podcast of Harvard Business School.